Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Monday morning trading room. Hang on here just a second. We'll get the screen share going on. The market's just opening up. Okay, bear with me here for just a second. Okay, sorry about that. I, <laughs> I'm not a multitasker. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, welcome to the Monday morning trading room. Uh, I trust you had an enjoyable weekend. Uh, mine was very nice, thank you, but a little bit too short as usual. Uh, for those of you new in the trading room, let me give you just a really quick overview of what you're looking at here. This is the diversified trading system along with the Raptor. Here in the top left is the Hawk Micro Scalper, top right Falcon Swing Trader. Bottom left is the Eagle Trend Trader, and then, of course, in the bottom right here is the Raptor. I'm following the NASDAQ on this monitor. I've also got the Russell and the E-Mini open on my other monitor. Uh, if there is something you would like to see, uh, I can certainly try to pull it up for you, although I will warn you, I've been, ever since I had trouble with my data a couple weeks back, um, some of the outside markets have not been coming in correctly. And I do encourage you to ask questions if you have them. I see Michael's in the room this morning, so he's going to save me a whole lot of typing. Because Michael sent me a, an email yesterday. And one second here while I pull it up. Okay, so um, Mike asks, he says, okay, hi, Eric. Well, hi, Mike. Um, I'm having trouble getting started. I may have one good day and the next I blow up my paper account. It seems like the market pulls back right after the system gets a signal. So not sure what the steps I go through to determine what signals to take and where to enter the market. Should I just match the trades you are taking in the room? Also, is the 446 defined as a four tick brick on the chart, four ticks on the first brick of the cloud setup, six ticks on the second brick of the cloud setups? I'm sure others have gone through this so we need to figure out to, how to get over this hurdle. And you're absolutely correct, Mike. Uh, a lot of people have had a, a similar issue. And I see Michael's written some follow-up emails since then. And he added, I reviewed the market for the past week and did market replay. And I'm going to go for smaller targets and a different stop strategy and see how it goes to do better money management. I probably rely too much on finding the big move. And then lastly, part of it may be psychological and I'm trying to get more disciplined. 
and actually have a plan to follow rather than shooting from the hip. I'm trying a new approach this week, would be, but would be interested in anything you can add to help. I don't always want to ask a basic question in the trade room and take up people's time. Okay. Uh, first off, please don't be shy about asking questions, no matter how basic you think the questions are. Uh, people who have been in the trade room for a while, um, hopefully they know their way ar around the tools already. This is not just a trade room, it is also a training room. I try to point out trades for you, of course, but the, the big purpose of the room is to get you proficient with your tools. Now, to that end, I encourage you to be patient with yourself because, you know, there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve here. This is, this is something new. This is, trading is going to be unlike anything you've tried before. Um, whatever your, your current business is, you're, I'm sure you weren't always good at it. Right, whether you were a doctor, a lawyer, um, an excavator operator, a plumber, you weren't always good at it. You made mistakes. Um, you cost your boss money. <laughs> well, now you're the boss. So when you're making mistakes, it's going to cost you money. And uh, like I said, there's a little bit of a learning curve. You have to learn to become proficient with your tools. These are your new tools, and you have to get a handle on how they work. So cut yourself a little bit of slack. Like I said, there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve involved here. And don't remember or, or, or don't forget that the markets aren't going anywhere. I When I started out, I was <laughs> scared to death. The markets would no longer be around by the time I got good trading. Well, I've been trading for uh, 25 years now, and the markets still haven't gone anywhere. They're still around. I'm also going to share uh, an email here from Ron. Um, Ron was asking me about the trade manager and at Ninja 8, and if I haven't shared with you already, uh, we're in the middle of reprogramming Trade Manager for Ninja 8. It seems Ninja 8 is finally stable, or at least stable enough that we can try to reprogram it. They've stopped changing it every couple of weeks. So keep your fingers crossed on that. But what I wanted to uh, share before I get into Mike's questions, Ron, uh, at the end of his email, he says, P.S. I'm 11 for 11 positive entries. Love your max two trades a day philosophy and your words. Is this really the best trade I will see today? Game changer. All right, so let's get back here to Mike's questions because uh, Mike asked some really good questions and I'm going to go over, I'm going to show you how you can get a better idea uh, which way the market might be going, which signals are going to be more viable and which ones you should actually, you know, take, uh, try to take. I should also add that the summertime is a tough time to trade. Uh, the, the markets in the summer tend to be a little bit quieter. If we take a look here at our daily chart, just to get an idea of the ranges, you can see um, the spring, April, May, June, even decent ranges. Oh, well, actually, July wasn't bad, but look what happens toward the tail end of July, with the exception of a couple of bars here. Most of the days are pretty small, pretty small, pretty quiet. And if you have the opportunity of a continuous chart, you can scroll back and you can see what was going on last fall and you'll see more of the same. So that's, um, 
that's something to bear in mind as well. When the market is in this summertime lull, uh, things tend to move a little bit slower. The markets tend to move a little bit more sideways. So it does tend to get a little bit more uh, frustrating at times. Yeah, like Steve adds here. He says, the summer is easy to trade and tough to make profit. I'm getting killed this summer. All right, let's see what we can do here. First, let's deal with the with the easy part of uh, Mike's question. The 446 settings. And you know what? I'm just going to bring over my e-mini chart. Now, the 446 is usually for instruments that trade more than $10 a tick. Or if you open up a chart, uh, and here I will show you. Well, here, let's take a look here at the Russell first. I have, um, oh, I have the Russell at 20 ticks. That's why it looks that way. Okay, if you open up your chart and it looks like this, where your daybreak lines are just so close, right, how are you going to get any trades when your chart looks like this. This is what your E-mini would look like with the standard settings. This is what um, the Aussie dollar might look like and a handful of other markets. The point is there's not enough going on here during the day that you can actually get a signal. So you may want to try the faster settings and those are the four, four, six settings. The uh, first thing you need to change is you need to change your brick size. And in order to change your brick size, you're going to right click on your chart. You're going to go to your data series. And from here, you can adjust your brick size. So you want to change your brick size to four ticks. Once you have that done, now we want to change uh, your clouds and your other Raptor parameters to be in sync with your new brick size. The idea is that uh, there's a there's a rough correlation between the Raptor clouds and and bars versus the tick size on your chart. Okay, so you're going to right click on your chart. You're going to go to your indicator window. You're going to find your Raptor 2.0, highlight that, and then pull down here to where your clouds are, your big cloud is going to be set at six, or your slow cloud, your second cloud, faster cloud will be set at four. And then your Hawk brick size is also set at four. So there's your four, four, six. Now feel free to experiment. You know, this, uh, the nice thing about the Raptor, of course, is that you have access to these settings now. The DTS system is pretty much locked. You can't change anything there. All right, and once you have that done, then you can apply your settings and your chart should be a little bit more spread out. And the next test, what you want to do is you want to, especially if you've changed some of your, your settings, is to see how the signals are developing. Are they giving you decent signals? And it's not that every signal is going to work out and we'll go over that in a second. But when you produce a number one signal, is there some follow through, at least enough to find your high probability target? Likewise, here's a number three. Um, number two signals, that's a whole other story. But um, the second number two signal, which gives us our 232 two setup, did have some follow through to it. So it's looking like the 446 is going to work pretty well overall for this market. If I was producing a bunch of signals and none of the signals were going anywhere, 
then I may have to reconsider the settings. But if you write me and you ask, hey, Eric, what settings should I use for such and such a market? I'm probably going to write you back and say, go with the default settings first. And if you're not getting enough trades or too many trades, then we can look at changing to something else. All right, so that was the first part of Mike's question. That was the easy one. Okay, um, now after I read you Ron's uh, remark, you probably already have an idea where I'm gonna be going with this. And namely, it's the idea of a trading quota. A lot of people come to trading with the idea that if I only trade more, I'll make more money. And it's, it's so tempting because really in the non-trading world, that's how things work. Right? If, I, if I see more patients, if I see more clients, if I produce more widgets, I will make more money. The difference between trading and the non-trading world is that the non-trading world, you get paid for what you do. The trading world does not work that way. You do not necessarily uh, get paid for what you do. In fact, it can often cost you <laughs> for, for doing what you do. So in trading, we want the mindset of looking for opportunities. We're, we're sifting through whatever analogy you want to say. We're sifting for gold or we're digging through through uh, dirt or <laughs> shuffling through the garbage or whatever. But we're looking for a, a decent opportunity. We're looking for that diamond in the rough that we can uh, invest in and hopefully it will go in our direction. In, when people come to me for coaching, uh, their number one problem, without exception, is over trading. I, uh, I see people, they come to me and I'll, if they do keep a trading journal, I'll look at their trading journal, they'll have like 20 or 30 trades on the day. That is trading far, far too often. You have to keep the mindset too that it's not uh, how frequently you trade, but that you're right when you trade. Uh, I've shared this before, but it bears repeating. If you can earn $100 a day trading, and effectively that's just two $50 trades. All right, so here, well, there's $50 in the NASDAQ. Let's see, since the market opened here, let's, let's say we just took a couple of signals just whatever signals we're printing. So here is signal number one. Okay, hit our $50 target. Actually, we hit our $100 target on the day on the very first trade, about two minutes in. If you can do that every single day, there is no limit to how much money you can make. Actually, I should restrict this to the singles. Okay, so there's there's trade number one. Market goes up, hits our $50 target. A few minutes later, we get another signal. We get a number, another number three signal. There's trade number two. We hit our $50 target. We are five minutes into the day, and we've hit our trade quota. Problem is, most people don't have the discipline to stop there. But the fact of the matter is, if you can do that every single day, if you can earn two, if you can find two $50 trades or one $100 opportunity, there is no limit to how much money you can make. Because after that, it becomes a game of multiples where you just add more and more contracts. Even if you're small, a small trader, you're starting out you know, with a very small account, if you can do that day in and day out, 
let's say you can only do one fifty dollar trade. Let's say you're trading like a five thousand dollar account or even a, a three thousand dollar account. And you can only do one fifty dollar trade. If you can find one fifty dollar trade a day, that will equate to ten thousand dollars at the end of the year. Well, now your little three or four or five thousand dollar account is a fifteen thousand dollar account. Okay, now you got a little bit more muscle behind you. Now maybe you can find two fifty dollar trades at the end of that year. Just by doing that, two fifty dollar trades a day, you will earn twenty thousand dollars. Now your little fifteen hundred uh, fifteen thousand dollar account is closer to being a thirty or thirty five thousand dollar account. And again, now you're getting more clout. <clears throat> so now, um, instead of taking uh, a single contract on those two $50 trades, maybe you can trade two contracts. Now, all of a sudden, you're making $40,000 a year. After that, maybe you can take three contracts. Now you're earning $60,000 a year. After that, maybe you can take five contracts. Now you're earning $100,000 a year. So even if you started with, say, just $5,000 and you were able to, to master this concept, within about five years or less than five years, you could potentially be earning $100,000 a year trading. And this is the true secret to trading. It's not what are the best settings for stochastics or what is the best brick size for crude oil or it, it's not the mechanic part. It's the, it's the money management part. You know, the, Forget the HFT traders because we'll never compete with those guys. The high frequency traders, they're they're scalping in and out, you know, <laughs> they're in and out of here on a single bar, on a few ticks, they're in and out. We're not going to trade that way. We need to focus on uh, finding the best opportunities. All right. And then we're going to limit our trades to two or three trades a day. The way I like to think of it with the quota is, let's say you, you're you gonna start modestly because you have a small account. Let's say you're gonna look for two tra winning trades a day and a positive result. So that means we wanna finish the day in the black. Let's say we take the first trade, we hit our $50 target, hooray for us. Let's say we take the next trade and we lose $150 on the trade. Okay, so we're down um, $100, right? We made the 50, the second trade, we lost 150, we're down $100. So we've met our two trade quota, but we are in the red. So we want to finish at the black. So we're going to look for another trade. And let's say the next trade we hit is another $50 winner. And for argument's sake, let's say the next trade we hit is another $50 winner. Now we, we are even. And if the opportunity presents itself, we will find another $50 trade. And then we're done. So by now we've, we've actually found, what have we found? Five trades. We've tried to find five $50 winners. One was a loser. So we've met our two trade quota and we are now in the black. So we're gonna stop trading even though it's just $50. You also need to have a loss limit on the day so you don't end up blowing up your account. Because there are going to be days that the market is just not very cooperative. And you need to prepare yourself that if this is one of those days, I'm not going to sink my account. I have met two separate people who have each blown up. One blew up a $20,000 account. The other blew up a $25,000 account in a single day. In a single day. I was, uh, 
my lamp took a little trip across the room the day the first time I lost a thousand dollars. I can't imagine losing twenty five thousand in a day. You have to have a safety net, and that can either be a a money pain threshold, or it can be a percentage of your account. Typically, if you get a five percent drawdown on your account, it's probably not your day. There's something not right. Uh, you may as well pack up your toys and come back the next day. Five percent is usually an amount you can recover from in in one or two or three days. Or you can just have a pain threshold. You know, whether it's uh, $500 or $1,000 or $2,000. Uh, so long as it th that loss amount does not uh, represent too much of your trading capital. So for instance, if you're trading a $10,000 account, a $2,000 uh, safety net is is far too high right you can't afford to blow up uh 20 percent of your trading capital so though that's lesson number one is you have to um you have to limit your exposure in the market Excuse me. The more often you are in the market, the, the greater the potential that you are going to incur a losing trade. Now, before I get to actually uh, helping you identify which are the better opportunities, let me add one more piece of advice. And this one's not going to make a whole lot of sense to people. Uh, they don't see the point behind it. But believe me when I tell you that this will help you like nothing else journal your trades get yourself i do it on a little ring binder and i really should update this photo but let me find you my old i did a photo one day years ago of my where did i put it of my trading journal Uh, got it. Where'd you go? Oh, there it is. Okay, this is, uh, <laughs> what year is this? This is a few years old now. Um, yeah, 2013. Okay. Uh, you're going to develop your own shorthand, but even though this journal is over five years old now, I can still tell you exactly what was going on. And you're not just going to record the mechanics of the trade, although that's important. And this is also important because you can double check it against your, your order execution. But I make a note of the day, uh, the instrument, my entry, my stop loss. I also make a note of my profit target now and uh, the time of the trade, what I, whether I was buying or selling, E stands for Eagle. Now I just do a B or an S for buy or sell. Uh, the result of the trade, uh, but most importantly, why? Why did I take the trade? You should always have two reasons for taking a trade. So if you can't think of two reasons to take a trade, you probably should not take the trade. But you know, even all these years later, I can still tell you it was the first signal of the day. It looked like a head and shoulders top. What was the result? Well, I got in too early. There was no trend yet. Now I uh, highlight all my lessons with a great big star. And what will happen is that over the course of a couple of weeks, and honestly, it will take no longer than that, you will start to see patterns emerging. And you will learn from these patterns. These will be good and bad things. Uh, you can see from here, this is how we developed the first micro macro crossover on the hawk. Because I kept seeing the same thing happen over and over and over again, and it kept being profitable. 
$100 profit here, $100 profit here. This is how we developed the second push entry on the Falcon. I was buying, I waited for the second push, it turned out to be a very nice little profit. All right, so do yourself a favor, get yourself a, a notebook and keep track of your trades. Now, I, I should tell you, I very, very rarely review my trades at all. I know some people who re review their trading journals. I'm not one of those, but I will tell you the simple fact uh, that you are writing things down by hand imprints on your memory. And you're going to, the next couple of days later, when you write the same thing down again, it's going to imprint on your memory. And like I said, you are going to see patterns develop. So it is probably one of the best trading tools um, of the 90% of traders that lose money. I can tell you that 99% of them do not keep a trading journal. Out of the 10% that, of traders that make the money, I can tell you that 99% of them do keep a trading journal. And that last 1% is either, either just a naturally gifted trader or flat out lucky. But chances are pretty good that you're not him or her. So do yourself a favor, keep a trading journal. All right, so how, how can we determine which signal is going to be a better opportunity than the next signal? How can we say this is going to be a good trade that I should try to take? Well, we do have the signal prompts to help you along. Uh, let me first focus on the number two signal. The number two signal, because it's counter trend, has the potential to cost you more money than any of the other signals. Of all the signals, um, the number two signal requires the market conditions to be optimal for the signal to work out. What makes the number two signal so inviting is that the potential of it looks so good. And when a number two signal unfolds, it usually moves very quickly. You know, it'll waste no time getting down to its profit target. There's no stress on the trade when the trade is working correctly. Um, the number two signal, and now that I've told you that it's one to avoid, let's take a look at the best parameters for a number two signal. And that's actually going to be when your cloud becomes very, very broad. Because a, a really wide cloud tells you the market is overbought, or in the case of a downtrending market, which am I going to have one? It's going to be oversold. Now, this cloud here, not very broad uh, compared to this one. This one's getting pretty fat. Uh, the number two signal, be, because it is a counter trend signal, first has to have a trend to reverse. So you need to have something resembling a trend. And the targets for the number two signal is always going to be the hard edge. I usually go for the second hard edge. But uh, you can see even here, uh, it just made it a little bit past the first hard edge, and then the trend resumed. Uh, the other thing that makes the number two signal so difficult is it blocks you from getting back into a with trend signal. I like the 232 type setup for a counter trend signal. I thought we had one here somewhere. No. The 232 means that the first counter trend signal just kind of warns you. 
that a counter trend is going to take place. Then we get a hard edge bounce, a number three signal, and that in turn is followed by another number two. That signal has the potential of a, a greater move lower. All right, so if you're interested in those number two signals, uh, look for that two, three, two setup. That will give you the best opportunity on a counter trend trade. But for the most part, you're going to be better off avoiding your counter trend trades entirely. Okay, so now we have uh, the rest of them. We have the number one signal and the number three signal. Both of them have to do with, with trend. The number one signal is going to print when a new trend is trying to emerge. This one printed as a number one signal. It could have just as easily been the number three signal. The reason it was a number one signal is the cloud went out of sync here. Went out of sync right through there. Then it came back into sync. And we had that little bit of a pullback. And then it tries to resume the trend. So we're looking at this chart. And to the left of our chart, it seems as though we have a little bit of a trend. And so now we're getting a continuation signal. Like I said, this could just as easily have been a number three. I know we've, we already know where this market is going, but realistically, do we think this is a good signal? Is this a signal worth trying? Well, yeah, I think it might be. And let me tell you why. First off, we have the trend, right? We obviously are in an uptrend. Secondly, the market is continuing to make higher swings, higher swing lows. But lastly, and probably most importantly, I have some room up here before the market encounters the last swing high. Right? I got some I got a little bit of room to make this trade work or at least get this trade perhaps to a break even if the market isn't cooperating. So the first thing you want to look at is the market context. Is there a trend? Is it up? Is it down? Or is there no trend? If the trend is up, well, then I should probably try to stay with the trend. If the trend is down, likewise. If there is no trend, okay, well, then things get a little trickier. Um, then I'm going to be looking for, you know, we've, we've seen the trading ranges right, where the market will be buying the bottom quarter of the trading range selling the top quarter is my signal developing in a buy zone or is it developing in the sell zone but in this case i think we've got a market that seems to be wanting to trend higher right we're making the higher swing lows the buyers have controlled the last swing Whoever controls the last swing controls the market. So right now, the buyers have control of the market. And like I said, logistically, I have room here that I can do something with this trade. So for clarity's sake, I'm just going to take it on the hash mark. I can risk my trade two stops back or two swings back. And you can see I've got enough room here that if the market goes up and starts to react i have some i have some room here that i can do something with this trade so the market in fact does go up it reacts a little bit now i'm getting a couple of bars in my favor now i can actually take my stops from down here and i can start to roll them up so even if the trade reverses once again, let's say I'm wrong about the trade, the market reverses once again, 
comes and stops me out. Whereas my initial risk was $400. And remember, that's 2% of my capital. It looks like I would have got tagged for, I don't know, about 100 bucks. Well, if this is 2% of my capital, $100 is, you know, like three quarters of a percent of my trading capital. Those kinds of losses are not going to ruin you. So you shouldn't be upset if you get that kind of loss. This is actually what I would refer to as a good loss. You did everything correctly. Uh, the market just didn't follow through. And from here, you should watch the market a little, a little bit and you should see what happens next because there's a lesson to be learned. You've already paid for the lesson. You may as well learn something from it. If the market now reverses and goes higher again and goes up to where your profit target would have been, what's the lesson learned? I was too quick with my stops, right? I should have left my stops um, two swings back rather than get scared about the trade. I should have left my stops and I would have been profitable. Or if, uh, if the market continues lower, and just keeps heading lower and lower and lower. Well, what's the lesson learned? I did the right thing. I took my stop out early and I managed that trade as well as it could have been managed. So, you're never going to have all the pieces to the puzzle. It really boils down to market context. And can do I have enough room on this trade that I can do something with it if the market starts to go sideways on me? Trend is always paramount. If, if you are in doubt about anything else, stay with the trend as much as possible. Even on like this number three signal right here, the market is continuing to make higher lows. Right? Every time the sellers push back, the buyers recover. Will there be a pushback up here? Almost guaranteed. So now you have a number three signal. Now you have a decision to make. Is this a good opportunity? Well, it's a high probability opportunity. We know that. Um, if I take the trade on the hash mark, there's swing one, there's swing two. Can I afford the trade? Yes, I can. Can I do anything with the trade as the market encounters this swing high? Well, maybe. You know, if the market goes up and it flinches early, well, then I'm going to be in a little bit of trouble. Although we know the buyers are pushing, there should be at least one opportunity in here somewhere. It may only be for a bar, but there should be one opportunity for me to take my stops from down here and roll them up here, at least to take, or even to here, just to take some of the risk out of the trade. Or if the market continues higher, if I'm running an auto break even, there's a good chance the auto break even will be hit. And even if the market doesn't hit my profit objective, I can probably still get out with a break even type trade. So it's not the best looking setup, but it's not the worst either. And at this point, it becomes a judgment call. Um, and really it's like <laughs> playing poker you know you if you think the trade is viable you put your money down you get your cards and then you manage it the best you can and in this case you see all the reactionary points where all these tails here these would be opportunities for us to start to bring our stops in if the next bar was a reversal bar 
I would be more inclined to bring my stops up quickly and settle for a break even. But you can see in this case, the trend uh, triumphed and the market continued higher. And that's really what it amounts to. It, it amounts to trying to uh, find the best opportunity, trying to decipher the trend. I think it's plain today that the market is in a strong uptrend. And so we're going to be looking for buying opportunities. As the cloud gets broader, we may see a top develop, right? The cloud is now, let's see, we're 74, uh, 51, and the top end of the cloud sitting around 74, 70, 71. So we've got a 20 tick or a 20 point cloud, that's 80 ticks. That's a pretty wide cloud. So if we see the market stumble a little bit, right, it's going to start going sideways here a little bit. It's going to make a retest, and now it's going to attempt to head lower. We will produce a number two signal. That might be worth a try. Now, I wouldn't risk the full 2% on it. You know, I wouldn't set it up like this, go like that, and risk $400 on the trade or the better part of 400, I would probably lock, because it is a lower probability signal, I'd lock myself into a, a single, into a single contract. And, you know, $150, okay. It's not gonna ruin me, maybe I'll, I'll try it. So I don't know if that helped. I hope it helped. <laughs> so we'll just wait here for a minute. We'll see what they... What they give us. Oh, we, oh, wow, we're almost an hour into the session as it is. So an hour in, if there's been an established trend, there is very often a chance the market will try to reverse on itself. So we'll keep a lookout for a potential reversal signal. And you know what? When you get when you get past your paper trading point and you're you're starting to trade real money, well, you should treat your paper trading as realistically as possible. Um, just as an aside, but you shouldn't be afraid about missing moves. If you're unsure of what you're seeing, just watch. Let it go by there's always going to be another opportunity. Um, yeah, sure. Um, Mike's asking, Eric, would you mind showing the NASDAQ brick size settings again? Uh, I just go with the defaults. So for the NASDAQ, I've got the eight tick brick. That's on my data series. And I have the eight ticks. 
And then the rest is just the, the defaults for the Raptor. So if I go to my indicator panel, I find my Raptor 2.0. You'll see that it's just the default settings, the 12, the 8, the 6. The 446 was for any market that trades the more than $12, or pardon me, $10 a tick, or if the market's especially slow. Like you may want to interject it into crude oil. Crude oil's been a bit of a dud lately. Uh, certainly the E-mini S&P is the only really popular market that we have to change the settings for. Otherwise, you should always, I would recommend you always start with the defaults. Yeah, no problem, Mike. No, you, you guys should ask questions. I, I see a lot of the same names in the room every morning, and I know most of you don't ask questions, which is fine. I know you pick up stuff from, from other people's questions, and that's good. But if there's something bugging you, you should ask. I'll, I'll do my best to answer. I can't guarantee it will always be a good answer, but I'll do my best to answer. You do a lot of waiting in trading, especially in the summertime as well. You spend a lot of time waiting for, for a good looking opportunity, especially now that we know the market's in a bit of an uptrend. Our best opportunity is going to come on a pullback. So we're gonna look for a number three signal or perhaps for a number two signal and the market to make a pullback, and then maybe we can take a number three signal. Yeah, okay, Mickey asks, I've, I've been having some sound trouble, so maybe I missed this, but regarding the clouds, the darker part is the slow soft edge, and if it's on top, it is bullish. If, it on, if it's on the bottom, it's bearish. The grayish part of the cloud is the faster hard edge. Okay, we have, we have two, two clouds stacked one on top of the other. These are actually borrowed from the eagle. So if you see what the eagle cloud looks like, what we've done is we've just taken another one and with the faster setting and we, we stacked it on top and now you're getting two clouds printing. And they're gonna, well, I'm not gonna be able to draw it at an angle, but you know what it looks like. It's going to look like this. So yes, this faint line on top, this is what we refer to as the soft edge. The, the bright grayish lines, these are the hard edges. So this is the hard edge of the faster cloud, and this is the hard edge of the slower cloud. The slower cloud, by the way, is your eagle cloud. This hard edge will coincide with the hard edge on the eagle. See, the values are, well, pretty much the same. The brick size is a little different. Okay. Uh, when the clouds are stacked with the soft edge above the hard edges, the market, we're going to be looking for buy signals. And when it is stacked with the soft edge, Below the hard edges, we're going to be looking for sell signals. We're going to consider the market more bearish than bullish. And at this point, the market becomes more bullish than bearish. Uh, John asks, is there a PDF or 
video that explains the Raptor in detail. Um, I would, apart from today's video, I would recommend you go to the YouTube channel. I'm going to try to figure out a way to archive this one so that you can easily access it. Go to the YouTube channel and go to the Indicator Warehouse channel. You may want to bookmark this for easy reference. The August 2nd session, the first 20 minutes or so of that session, I go through all the Raptor signals in great detail. We don't have a PDF because most people aren't interested in reading anymore. They'd rather see it in a video. But this will be a very good overview. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to pull this particular video, um, edit it, and we'll include it down here with the with the Raptor signals. But that will be a really good resource, as will be today's um, video. You want to make a note of those. Uh, Frank asks, out of curiosity, how can I choose a contract to exit in a series of entries? Example, can I exit the second contract in a series of three separate entries? Well, if you're talking about just taking a contract off, um, no problem. Uh, the simplest way, let's say we were Okay, one second here while I set this up. Okay, let's say we took this buy signal here. And we've got four contracts in play. Oh no, that's not exactly what you're asking. Okay, one second, I thought I, thought I could do it here for you. I will show you how to do it though. Okay, so let's say we bought in with one contract here, uh, bought in with another contract here, and well, let's back this up. So we, we initially bought down here, bought a second contract here, bought a third contract here. And if I understand your question correctly, it's how can I scale out of my position? The simplest way to scale out of a position if you are long is to make sure your quantity is set at one, go to manual mode, just by clicking on your risk percent button, takes you to manual mode, and hit your sell button once. That will offset one position. If you are asking, can I offset, can I sell this contract here, the second one out of the three? No, there's no way to do that. Um, because what happens is these contracts are all, they're, they're not unique. So when you sell one, when you go to sell one, let's say we sell one right here. Um, you still have two open contracts and it isn't until you sell the other two that the position is finally offset and you can say, okay, well I made, or here, let's sell one here and we'll sell two up here. It isn't until all three contracts are finally offset that you can say, okay, I made this much profit on two of my contracts and this much of a loss on one of my contracts, right? Because this is the only one that was a loser. The other two were profitable.
But that's the simplest way to scale out of a position. The other way you can scale out of a position. So let's say you bought, uh, where were we buying? You bought down here, you bought again here, you bought again here. And now you want to start scaling out of a position. Well, the sim uh, you can also right click on your chart and you can select profit targets. Right? You can select a, an order to sell and put that order in. And then when the market gets up there, because it's a sell order, it will offset one of your positions. But like I said, like I said, until the whole position is settled, you won't know whether the whole position is profitable or or not. It would be an interesting idea, though, wouldn't it, to say, "Oh, I want to, I want to sell this one." It's not the the thing with futures too that people forget. It's not like the stock market where you actually own this stock this is simply a contract you have contracted with somebody to buy nasdaq futures at 74 60 and three quarters because you think the price of the nasdaq futures will go up somebody contracted with you to sell a contract at 74 60 and three quarters because they thought the price was going lower. So that's what makes futures unique is they are contracts. You really don't own this. It is just a contract to buy and to sell. You think it's going up. Somebody else thinks it's going down or vice versa. Looks like we're getting a little bit of a top here. We're getting a little bit of a number two type formation developing. See how we're retesting the high. If we get another sell signal, that will be a number two. And it's almost right on time. Uh, Frank, adds it looks like the first entry is the one to be sold when selling one of the three um well and by the way folks this is probably a decent uh selling opportunity on that number two signal if somebody's looking for a trade like i said frank you won't know for sure until the whole position settles so let's say those were your three buys so let's say you sold one here uh, you sold another one here, and you sold the third one down here. So, realistically, it, it will be profit, profit, loss. But, again, at the end of the day, it all depends how it all settles out, right? because they're not assigned to each other. It all, it's all <laughs> how it comes out in the wash, as they say, how everything settles. Okay, so here's our number two signal. And we'll do this one in hindsight. Come on, there we go. So there's our number two. Um, stops on these counter trend trades should not go right there, one or two ticks above the, the high. Give yourself a little bit of room on the trade. Remember, your stop loss is not a loss unless it gets hit. So give yourself a little bit of room Give yourself a chance to make this trade work. Okay, class, should I roll stops yet or not? Let me 
Anybody want to play? Is this the right time to be rolling a stop or should I be waiting? Okay, Frank's for waiting, Phil's for waiting. Anybody else want to play? Oh, Ray says wait. I think we should wait. <clears throat> it's not that I, I'm necessarily right. Here comes this hard edge bounce, right? So here's the number three, here's the two, here's the three, even if the signal doesn't print. That still hits the hard edge, a little bit of a push up. If we come back with another number two, then I can become a little bit more aggressive, I think, on the stops. If we see the market turn here one more time, whether it prints another number two signal or not, the, the principle is the same. Um, yeah, good question here from John. Uh, John asks, are most of the Raptor clients on Ninja 7 or 8? I've had a couple of panic error freezes on Ninja 8, still new. Um, I don't know the exact statistics. I know we recommend people stay with Ninja 7 because it is is the more stable. I know there are a few owners that are on Ninja 8, but if you're on Ninja 8, you're not able to use the trade manager because of programming conflicts with that. Hopefully to be resolved shortly. I'd like to see at least one bar here move in my favor. And we're kind of trading in slow motion now. Okay, class, is it time to roll stops or not? <laughs> Gets a little trickier, doesn't it? Uh, okay, Frank's, Frank's still in favor of holding. Um, John asks, are we still on plan for Labor Day for the trade manager? That is the plan. Um, the programmers are working on it right now. And hopefully we will have it available early September. Phil is still holding as well. You guys got nerves of steel. <laughs> uh, Frank's asks, do you know if DTS will be updated soon? If you're asking, is, will it be updated to Ninja 8, DTS and Raptor are Ninja 8 compatible? It's just the trade manager is not. So if you if you want to use Ninja 8, um, you can with your Raptor and your DTS charts. They will function on Ninja 8. Uh, you'll have to download the Ninja 8 versions from the members area. 
but the trade manager, that's, that's the big one. That's the big hurdle. As you can imagine, there's a lot of moving parts with the, with the trade manager. And it, it didn't help that uh, Ninja kept moving the target. That was really the holdup, is the, the programming. They kept making changes. Uh, some of you will already know this, but it isn't like um, back in the old days. <laughs> uh, when the... It used to be that before software designers would release a piece of software, they would try to debug it. <laughs> they would try to, they would at least attempt to um, find the major glitches before they release it to the public. Uh, now that's not the case. What they do is they'll release a beta version and they'll let users find the problems rather than waste their programmers time and money they uh, they let you do it for them and so as the bug reports come in the programmers fix them but sometimes that means tearing down a significant part of the uh, software and of course there's the whole domino effect if they change one part of the software programming then something else changes and something else changes and so on it goes and that was very frustrating for us because we had the trade manager almost reprogrammed a couple of times and Ninja kept moving the target. And then we said, nope, that's it. We're not gonna invest any more time or money into reprogramming the trade manager until we know that Ninja 8 is at least relatively stable. And it seems like talking to Ninja, they're kind of done playing with it for the time being. So we're going to take another run at it. Yeah, Frank says, I like the rafter signal. It's not it's not a bad setup for a counter trend. We got the two, the, the first counter trend. We got the hard edge bounce. We've got the second number two signal. Uh, we even have a second push opportunity. Uh, at this point, I would probably start to roll my stops at least a little bit. You know, the market does seem to try to be heading lower. I may reduce my risk somewhere in there. The next push lower at this point is really going to be do or die for the sellers because we've had the buyers recover it here. We've had the buyers recover it here. We had the sellers push here. We had the sellers push here. If the sellers are going to make this happen, they've got to move the market lower. And if not, it's probably going to be time to go. But you can see things have gotten very, very quiet, very, very sideways.
All right, here we go. So at this point, especially if this bar breaks down a little bit, I would roll my stop in some more. So you can either still leave it up here and wait for the bar to break. There we go. At this point, I would start to get more aggressive with my stops. If I had to break even, it would probably be sitting, a uh, break even trigger is probably sitting somewhere around here. So it looks like they're kissing the break even target. Or I can even manually take the trade to break even. And now, of course, the pressure is off. If the trade works, it works. If it doesn't, well, I got my break even. And there we go. Did we hit our profit target? If not, we're awfully close. Um, okay. And there we go. Hooray for us. So if your objective, if you were working your $100 per day objective, you just made your $100 on a single contract and you are well on your way to reaching your, your trading potential. <laughs> like I said, after that becomes a numbers game. If $100 isn't enough, then, you know, you start to, where did I take that? I think I took that right around here. You just trade more contracts. See, it's still a thousand. It could be a thousand dollars. The NASDAQ is liquid enough, even the way it is right now, to absorb 10 contracts without even thinking about it. Okay, a couple of great questions here. Uh, I'll deal with Michael's question. He asks, if you miss the number three signal at 643, would you take the one at six? Or if you miss the one at 648, would you wait until the next buy at 653? Um, so if I missed, I think, no, if I miss this one, would I wait until the next buy at 6.53? Okay, yeah, great question. Great question. So essentially, uh, Michael's asking about these discretionary signals. These that don't really meet the high probability standards, so they don't produce their own number, but it is still a signal all the same. Um, this kind of comes back again to the idea of the market context and logistics. So the market context, the trend is definitely up. Um, you could do a couple of things. You could wait to see if there was a reaction here. Oh, it looks like that was your reaction bar right there. Oh, there we go. And then you could use that reaction bar as your entry bar. Right, because the market did trade lower here. You can tell by that candle. And then after that, it becomes, can I afford the trade with a reasonable stop? Now, I normally, oops, <laughs> I normally recommend a uh, two swing stop. So that means if I enter up here, there's swing one, there's swing two. Can I afford that? The reason I say two swings is it's not unusual to see a market react 
and retest the first swing. It may even break below the first swing. All that does is it gets the buyers excited again because there were buyers buying at this level right here. They had good reason to buy at that price. They thought it was a good price. So if the market comes down and dips below there, they're going to try to buy it yet again. Now, they may or may not be successful in rallying the market up again. But what is not very likely to happen is that the market will break the first swing and go down and take out the second swing without at least some sort of reaction. So somewhere in here, I'll have an opportunity to adjust my stops. However, if I place my initial stop right here below the first swing and the market comes down and just tags the first swing and then reverses higher, well, I've had no opportunity to adjust my stops, right? I just got tagged out. So even though this may be your initial stop and it seems like a very lopsided trade, it doesn't mean that's where your stop has to stay. Once I see the reaction, I can bring my stop in. And if I'm a little bit anxious on the trade, let's say the market does a little hiccup here. If I'm a little anxious on the trade, I can roll my stop up even tighter. So even if I do get tagged out here, I've lost, again, if this is 2% of my trading capital down here, I've lost, it looks like about $200. I've lost about one and a half percent of my trading capital. Those are not the kinds of mistakes that are going to cost you a lot of money. Right? Those are not the kinds of trades that are going to, to ruin you. The kinds of trades that are going to ruin you are the ones where you're losing more than you can afford. So a very good question. And that's probably how I would address that. If, and the nice thing about day trading too is you can see the charts unfold. So you can see the market go boom, boom, boom. If it seems like there's a pretty good pace to it, then yeah, I would be a little bit more inclined to take it. But honestly, at the end of the day, it always amounts to, can I afford the risk if this trade does not work out correctly? Um, <clears throat> Frank's asking here a feature he would like to see. I would like to see the new trade manager have targets and stops automatically entered when using a simple chart entry. Right click, select a, a sell or a buy. When the market takes that chart entry, the trade manager would then place the pre-selected stops and targets. Um, well, it, it sort of does that. What you can do is, uh, well, obviously you know what the set price is. You have to at the bare minimum, you have to set your entry and your stop loss, and then you have to click your your submit button. Um, alternatively, you can use your buy or sell buttons. If you, especially if you have a stop already in play, let's say I'm going to do the swing high, and let's say I'm going to sell the next uh, sell signal. I know this isn't quite what you're you're after, but there's an Excel signal. When I click my sell button, I will get my stop and I will get my pre-selected profit target as per my target strategies. So if I if I chose to split this up. It would also do that for me as well. So it's a it's an alternative of sorts. Uh, Ray 
says, if this was my trade, since it is now going sideways, I would try to get out with the $50. So that was the, the number two short. And there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, if you think the market's going to start drifting and failing, then take whatever profit you have. Again, not a bad strategy. <laughs> yeah, Phil sums it up here. He says $100, beans and rice. $200, chicken, beans and rice. $300, steak, beans and rice. <laughs> and that's, that's really a pretty good summary of trading. Well, we didn't do a lot of trades today, but hopefully it was still a, a beneficial session. Hopefully I answered a few of your questions about how to manage your trades and find your better opportunities when you get them. Come on down. You can do it. Are they going to flinch just before the hard edge? You stinkers, get down there. See, they're getting close to the, the high of opening range and this area right here. So they're uh, getting a few buyers excited because, of course, that's where the breakout occurred before. All right, folks, if you are going to continue trading today, I think you can expect a little bit more sideways trading now that we've seen a big, um, big rally up. Um, I would not get overly aggressive on the short side, I don't think. I think a uh, move back here to the hard edge is probably going to see a little bit of a bounce. They're not going to follow through on that. All right, everyone. If there are no other questions, we're going to wrap things up here today. Uh, have yourselves a wonderful day. I will see you again tomorrow. We'll talk to you then. Bye for now.